Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so today I'll basically use Vishy's slides to talk about optimization. And now one question is, why do we want to study optimization in a machine learning course? So as we have already seen that there have been a multiple, you know, instances where, okay. So we have already seen several instances where optimization, like we were presented some sort of optimization problem where we had some objective function subject to some constraints and we had to find out optimal solution that will minimize that objective function or maximize that objective function. So for example, if you want to solve a, uh, let's say, you know, um, we want to find parameter vector which will maximize the log likelihood of data. So that is an optimization problem, right? Similarly, in logistic regression, we wanted to find uh, this parameter w, which will maximize our log likelihood. So something like this, right? Summation over all our points and then yi log of 1 by 1 plus e to power minus w transpose xi plus 1 minus 1. So again this is we want to find out w that maximizes this objective function or sorry, I think it should minimize this objective function. So, so in machine learning and similarly like maybe in next class or next to next class, we'll uh, see another uh, classification algorithm called support vector machine that also reduces to an optimization problem. So optimization is sort of ubiquitous in machine learning and that's why like a lot of uh, focus on you know several learning people has been how to optimize better especially for problems that are uh, that come up in learning related contexts okay so today we will try to go through <coughs> some very basics of optimization um, and we will mostly focus on uh, a sort of subfield of optimization called convex optimization that is we will only concern ourselves to minimizing convex functions subject to convex sets. We will go through the definition of them, so do not worry. But typically the functions that we will consider will always look like this, like these are sort of nice convex functions or if you want to go to a harder class of function then this type of functions, okay. And we will also be interested in multi-dimensional case that is when you know our, our function is uh, uh, dependent on several variables, like here the function is a bivariate function okay so let's start with definition of convex functions okay so formally stated what convex function says is that if you have two points x and x prime and let's say their function values fx and fx prime then this line is always above the true functions okay that is for all lambda between 0 to 1 your f of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda x prime is less than equal to lambda f x plus 1 minus lambda f x prime. Okay. So this is clear. So for example, a function of this type is not convex. Because here if you consider these two points, then there are some points which are above this function. Okay, that is the my curvature of function should always be like this. I should not get any curvature like this. Okay, Isn't that clear? And you can then consider a smaller class of convex functions called strictly convex functions when that inequality is uh, replaced by or uh, strict inequality. That is, you don't. You cannot, so if x and x prime are not the same point, then fx and fx prime cannot be exactly the same. That's precisely it. Well, as in when you are connecting. 
that is a function like this is not strongly strictly convex because here these two points are exactly same value okay and all the intermediate points have the same value okay and then you can specialize the definition even more and you can say that uh, you can define this strongly convex functions where your function is not only uh, like function value at this point let's say is not only lower bounded by the average of these two or weighted average of these two but also you you, you are ensured some sort of gap here okay so intuitively what it means is that a strongly convex function is lower bounded by a quadratic function that is it will have at least the curvature of a quadratic function okay so this is just a simple exercise uh, so we saw the definition of convex functions where uh, we are talking about only two points x and x prime and we say that okay if you have lambda and 1 minus lambda which are both positive then this happens so you can just extend this definition to any like general n points okay and now your lambdas will be all positive and the sum to one and you say that okay sum over this sort of weighted average of all the points is less than weighted average of each individual function value at each of these points okay so this is called jensen's inequality so this you can try to do at home it's fairly easy to it follows directly from the definition of convex functions okay so let's look at some of the uh, common or like popular convex functions so one is uh, your squared norm half x square so this is one of the well nicest convex functions around okay and it is also strongly convex another convex function can be when you go to so again this is also a quadratic function but the curvature is not the same along both the variables the curvature can be a little bit different okay so there is sort of more curvature like this but in this direction there is not so much of curvature another example is negative entropy that is x log x plus 1 minus x log 1 minus x <coughs> this is also a convex function that is entropy is a concave function so inverse of inverse as a negative of a convex function is concave function and this is just a normalized negative entropy where you uh, your x plus y need not sum to 1 and that's why you have to put minus x minus y and this is also convex function then there is a popular loss function called hinge loss function so this will study when we'll study support vector machines but just one thing to keep in mind is that this is also convex and uh, like the loss function that we talked just now that of logistic uh, loss that is also convex another popular loss functions are linear function that is very easy to see that in fact it's a function which is both convex as well as concave that is if you have, your function is something like this that is it has absolutely no curvature at all then you can say it is convex as well as concave okay and then softmax which is sort of generalization of logistic loss and any norm any lp norm that is so lp norm if you recall is defined by or so it is convex in fact by definition norms themselves are convex okay so now let's move on to convex sets so here we were just talking about convex functions now we will talk about convex sets so if i draw a set then and if i have this property that 
uh, if I to take two points in the set, then all the points on the line connecting these two points are within the set, then it's a convex set. Okay. That is, if x and x prime belongs to set C, then all the points on the line joining x and x prime also belongs to set C. Okay. So, an example of a set which is not convex will be something like this, where these, this and this point are within the set, but all these points are outside the set. Okay. This we did not understand. Okay. So now let's look at let's go back to convex functions and try to understand concept called level sets of function. So suppose this is a bivariate function. So we can find out so level sets of this function will be sets where this function takes exactly the same value. So for example, this is x square plus y square. So if I look at um, symmetric sets or circles around the point 0 comma 0, then they will take exactly the same value, right? So if x square plus y square is equal to some r, then over all the points on that circle, your function value will be exactly r. So those are level sets of this function. So the way they will look like is something like this. Okay. So if you look from top down, these are the level sets of this function. Okay. And there is a very interesting property of level sets which is that if your function is convex, then all its level sets are convex. Okay. But is the converse true? Hmm? So if all the level sets are convex, then can you say that the function is convex? Function of what? Can you come, in, come to the book? Something like this? I'm not sure. Wait. Oh, oh okay. Wait. So that's what no, this is also not convex. Yeah, but its level sets are not convex. It's reflected. Level sets will be convex, but the function is not convex. Precisely. So if you if you think of this as a two dimensional function, then all its level sets are convex. But the function itself is not convex because there's a curvature in the opposite direction here. So now the optimization problem that we'll consider in this lecture will be that given a function fx, we want to find the minima of this function fx, right? And then later like we will consider a more special case or a more harder problem, sorry, where you want to minimize the function fx. but your point x cannot take arbitrary value. Your point x will be subjected to some uh, uh, or will be restricted to lie in some other convex function. Okay, That is something like this. So the general problem that we will like to consider is we'll take this form. Minimize fx such that fix is less than or equal to 0 for all i and maybe g i or g j x is equal to 0 for all j and both f i and g j are convex functions. Okay. And f x is also f is also convex. Okay. okay. 
So depending on the properties of these functions, individual convex functions, uh, you can characterize the solution also in a variety of manner. Okay. So for example, uh, for general convex function fx, the solution or the minima need not even be unique. You can have several uh, minima. For example, here, all these points will minimize this function fx. Okay. Whereas if your function is, say, strictly convex, then you are guaranteed that there is exactly one point that minimizes that function. Okay. And this again is an exercise that can you show that if a function is strictly convex, then there will be exactly one minima. Okay. So now let's quickly look at the operations that preserve convexity. So the set operations that preserve convexity are intersection. Like this is the most uh, used set operation that preserves con uh, convexity. Okay. And similarly, <coughs> uh, if you take a linear transformation of a set, then that is also convex. That is, if you have points x belongs to some set C, and then you take Ax, and that is, let's say, some C prime. So C prime is defined as x or Ax such that x belongs to C. So this set is also a convex set. The reason is that linear transformation, all it does is just rotates and stretch the uh, convex set, right? So for example, your convex set is something like this. You apply a linear transformation to it. Maybe it will rotate it and then stretch it along certain directions. But you will not destroy their convexity. OK. So this also you should try at home. And then similarly, inverse image of a convex set under linear transformation is convex. And that is almost trivial because linear inverse image of a linear transformation is also a linear transformation. Okay. And let's look at the function operations that preserve convexity. So if you just take non-negative um, linear combination of your function, that will be, again, of, uh, of your convex functions, that will also be convex. Okay, so let's quickly look at this. So let's say your function f1, f2 till say fn are all convex. And your weights w1, w2 till wn are all positive or non-negative. Then summation wi phi x will be convex. Okay. And the proof is extremely simple. So if you look at this, you know that each of the individual function is a convex function, so that's why summation Y lambda f i x right and now you just take your lambda out summation Okay, so this clearly proves that your non-negative linear combination will be um, convex. And in fact, you can show more things. For example, if, if each fix is strongly convex and wi is strictly positive, then the obtained function will also be strongly convex. Uh, that will be exercise you can do at home. It's not very hard to see. And another very interesting operation that minimize uh, that preserves convexity is pointwise maximum. Okay. So if you have let's say n functions, each of them are convex, and you take pointwise maximum of those functions, then that will also be a convex function. 
so can, so can anyone of tell you tell me why it is so so let me just draw it pictorially so let's say i have linear functions several linear functions okay so the, this will form the maximum of them right it's clear that it's a convex function now why is pointwise maximum function also convex so let's just go with the definition so my fx is max over all i fix right so f of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda x prime will be equal to max over all i fi lambda x plus 1 minus lambda x prime right and i know that each of the con function fi is convex so that's why this is less than equal to max over all i lambda f i x plus 1 minus lambda f i x prime right and now i know that this max over i is jointly over f i x as well as f i x prime right and this will be less than equal to if i take individual max that is max over i lambda f i x plus max over i 1 minus lambda f i x prime right is this clear and then this is just equal to lambda max of i f i x plus 1 minus lambda max over all i f i x prime which is equal to lambda f x plus 1 minus lambda f x prime so that's why point wise maximum function of convex functions is also convex and then you can do many other things like composition with a fine function so suppose g is a convex function and a is a linear transformation matrix then g of ax plus b will also be uh convex okay so now let's look at a very powerful characterization of uh optima of a convex function subject to a convex set okay. so we said that okay we want to minimize a convex function subject to a convex set so there is a very powerful first order property uh that will give that characterization so actually before even going there let me um uh, first give one more property of the convex functions which will make that other property easy to understand okay so if function f is a convex function then whenever you take its first order taylor expansion that is you write fx so this will be its first order taylor expansion that is x prime is some other point you write fx as fx prime or approximate fx as fx prime plus x minus x prime times gradient of fx prime so you know that your taylor expansion of a convex function or first order taylor expansion of a convex function will always be less than equal to the function itself okay so what it intuitively means is that <coughs> you wanted want to approximate this entire function fx and you look at this point so this is your point fx you can write your taylor expansion here okay and i'm sorry so this is your point x prime and around around this point you write your first order taylor expansion so you can see that this is just a constant plus a linear function right and it will look like something like this and you know for sure that this function will always lie on top of this function that it the function value will always be larger than the value that is taken by this linear function okay and this actually gives rise to 
a notion of distance between x and x prime according to f and that is called Bregman divergence. Okay. So suppose this is your any point x and this is your point x prime then what you can do is around x prime you can write the first order Taylor expansion of fx and the distance the actual distance between your lower bound and the function value itself is what is called Bregman divergence. And this is a very very powerful tool that is used in several optimization algorithms. Probably in next class we will talk little bit about, uh, about these but otherwise also they are very handy tools to keep in mind and they are uh, generalization of several well known distance functions. For example, if you set your fx to be half x, prime, half x square, then the Bregman divergence between x and x prime is precisely the Euclidean distance between the point x and x prime. Okay. Similarly, if you use your underlying function fx to be negative entropy, okay, then the KL divergence between point x and x prime is precisely the Bregman divergence generated by the negative entropy. Okay. So do you guys remember the KL divergence? That is KL divergence is sort of a measure of distance between two probability distributions. And the way that distance measure arises or at least one way to think about how the distance measure arises is through using Bregman divergence that is generated by negative entropy. Okay. So that side point aside, now let's understand the first order condition or optimality condition for our optimization problem. Okay. So let f be a differentiable convex function and suppose this f is defined over set x which is convex then x is optimal if and only if for all points x prime x prime minus x inner product with gradient of fx is positive. Okay. So if we draw the picture um, so this is your convex function. Well here actually the problem is not very interesting because um, uh, your gradient itself is always 0, right? So this thing is will always be greater than or equal to 0 no matter what x, right? But a better picture would be something like this that suppose you want to minimize this function subject to, um, let's say this is my, so subject to the constraint that my x lies in this set only. Okay. That is I cannot look in this area at all. I have to optimize this function subject to this set and we know that the optima lies here, right? Okay. And if you look at the gradient at the optima, okay. if you take any other x prime in this set, okay. Then the inner product of x prime minus x with the gradient is positive. That is, you are increasing the function. Okay. So, or in other words, if this was less than or equal to zero for some x prime, then what would I, why we should have been able to do is take x towards x prime and decrease the objective function, and that's why. It could cannot be optima. That's why if x is optima, then for all x prime in your set, x prime minus x in a product with your gradient at x should be positive. So this is called first order characterization of optimality. Okay. Okay. And if your set uh, um, like set of values is not constrained at all, that is you can take any that is uh, you do not have a constrained optimization problem you have unconstrained optimization problem then you should be able to set your gradient fx to be zero to achieve this right and that's precisely what like we have been taught since childhood that 
if you want to minimize a objective function or minimize a function or maximize a objective function also you basically set its gradient to be zero right Um, if x is an interior point, yeah, definitely gradient of f x should be zero. Only on the boundary, the gradient can be greater than zero, and still the point can be optimum. Okay. okay so, is this first order optimality condition clear? And why do we basically we try to just go in a direction so that the gradient is and goes towards zero okay. okay so here like remember whenever we were talking about our function we were saying that the function is differentiable convex function but is this a very strict requirement can we deal with non differentiable functions can we still write down these conditions uh, for non differentiable functions and the answer is yes okay <coughs> so for example this function which is piecewise uh, linear function this is a convex function but it is not differentiable but can we still characterize its optima like that the answer is yes only thing is that we need to use sub gradients instead of gradient okay so <coughs> if you remember like we gave this one characterization of uh, convex functions or differentiable convex function which is that your first order Taylor expansion should always lower bounded that is fx should always be greater than fx prime plus x minus x prime in a product with gradient at x prime right now and this is sort of the main condition which gives rise to that optimality condition right so if this gradient uh, doesn't exist then we can define a set sub gradient okay which will essentially satisfy this condition so by definition sub gradients satisfy this condition and that's why we'll be able to use it in our further analysis of optimality okay okay so that's the simple thing and it, geometrically what it means is that um, so if you had a differentiable function like this there will only exist one such direction which will lead to lower bound of your function right if you try to move it even little bit you will find out some points where your function value will uh, will be smaller than the taylor expansion or than the this function okay there will exist just one unique uh, direction which will ensure that it is it lies below the entire function and that will be precisely your gradient only thing is that when your function is not differentiable then you can have multiple such directions that is all these directions will qualify okay so all these directions will serve as perfectly good lower bound on this function okay but you can still define your sub gradient and you can work with your op algorithms almost as if you don't have any issue it works almost as if you had a differential function only problem is that your function can choose some bad directions and that's why uh, it might take long time to converge okay. so one very popular method to uh, do optimization is your gradient descent that is if you want to optimize this function you are here what you'll do is you take your gradient go in the negative direction of the gradient and that will give you another point with smaller objective function value right in, in case of sub gradient you can select 
any of the direction and some direction can be much more fruitful than the other directions okay so for example here for this function so you can take either this direction or this direction okay and while this direction is very useful because it will op min like suppose if i take this step i will come here and it has minimized my objective function by quite a bit whereas in this di in this direction if i take the equal amount of like same size same step size i will just come to here and the optim objective function has not been decreased that much and in certain cases objective function might not even decrease at all or very little so for example if the slope becomes even worse that is it's almost perpendicular to x axis then you will come here and you will still end up with just a small slightly little objective function value okay so that's why sub gradients can be used in your optimization you can still work you can get some reasonable um solution but uh, or you can get to the optimal solution but it can take you long time to get there and that's why there has been a long line of research as to how to differentiate or sorry how to optimize these non differentiable functions and can we use some structural special structure of the uh, of the functions okay how do we solve once one iteration no even in the next iteration you will be almost there well oh so i can draw a function which is which has several uh, discontinuities so in this example yes the the problem will be just in one iteration but i can draw a function which is uh, which can have several points of uh, non differentiability right and in that case it will be even more problematic and this is very easy to do in multi dimensional case so in one dimension sure i mean if i am restricted to finite number of non differentiable points then i cannot draw too many such um uh, points but in multi dimensional i can have several such points right so so yeah so this is uh, another example of non differential function and its sub gradient is defined by all points in range minus 1 to 1 right is this clear because you can take so this is your x is equal to y direction so from this direction to x is equal to minus y direction or sorry y is equal to minus x direction all of them are equal, all of them are you know good candidates to lower bound the center function all the planes will be lower bounding this function so so all the um all the directions from minus 1 to 1 are sub gradients okay so here again we can but still we can define our uh, optimality condition which is that if mu belongs to your sub gradient and x is mu belongs to sub gradient at point x then for all x prime x prime minus x in a product with mu should be positive if x is an optimal solution okay so we can define our optimality condition similar and now the goal will be to uh, and like you know if you are working in unconstrained optimization scenario then your goal will be to find out a point x such that zero belongs to the sub gradient okay so for example in the case of this function you like to find this point x because zero which is this direction belongs to your set of sub gradients all the other points do not have zero in them okay all right so let's do a little bit of warm up and see how can we like you know what are the optimality condition for minimizing a function like this okay and how can we compute um minimum value of your function here okay 
So So this is, I mean, fairly wait. So rather than going in this direction, let me go towards another direction, which is let's. So we know that. Um, so let me just uh, more formally write down the two algorithms that we almost already seen: the gradient descent algorithm and Newton-Raphson algorithm for optimizing a convex function. So suppose my problem is minimize minimize x fx and it is a unconstrained minimization problem. Okay. So the gradient descent algorithm, the way it proceeds is it it is an iterative algorithm. At each step it maintains iterate xt. So your next iterate, your xt plus 1 will be given by xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus times gradient of f8 xt. That is compute gradient of f at xt and you go in negative direction of that. And that will give you xt plus 1. And here there is one very critical parameter which is the step size. Okay. So, if you have too big a step size, then what can happen is something like this. So, suppose this is your function, okay, and you want to optimize here. Like, suppose this is your xt, you want to go from here. So, so this is your gradient direction, and if you take too small a step size, then what will happen is that you will just decrease your objective function by very little bit. But if you take too big a step size, let's say I took this big a step size, okay, I go from here to here, then what can happen is that I can in fact increase my objective function value or I might be at the same objective function value. And what can happen is that I can just zigzag around to get to the optimum. Okay. So determining exact, like you know, very good step size is a big challenge in um, gradient descent algorithms. And if your function has some good properties, then you can do, uh, then there are some good theoretical rates or theoretical step size known, which will give you good rate of convergence. So for example, if your function f is both strongly convex and its gradient is Lipschitz, that is Lipschitz continuous gradient. So I'll define this. Uh, with parameter sigma and let's say this with parameter uh, alpha. Then you can set your step size eta to be something like, um, you can set it to be a constant uh, which is given by alpha by sigma. Okay. So, actually I don't remember, the, the, there might be some 4 here or something like that. So, this I have to check. Maybe I'll get back to you on this class, next class. Um, but, oh, so let me define Lipschitz continuity. So, a strong convexity we know that f of x plus lambda x plus 1 minus lambda x prime Uh, is less than equal to fx prime plus 1 minus lambda fx prime minus sigma lambda 1 minus lambda by 2 x minus x prime square. So this is the definition of strong convexity. Lipschitz continuous of gradient essentially means that this should be replaced by plus alpha. So intuitively what it means is that your gradient of f should also be a continuous function. Okay. That is your function cannot be uh, non-differentiable. 
it has to be differentiable and in fact it will require something more than that that your gradient should not only be continuous but it should be something called Lipschitz continuous which is a stronger condition but if you have that for example a function like this has that when restricted to a small set then you can use a constant step size and that will get you to the optima very fast okay. uh, but let's say if you only know that your function is Lipschitz so let me define Lipschitz as well Lipschitz continuous Uh, so, function is Lipschitz continuous if fx minus fx prime is less than or equal to L, where L is your Lipschitz, continu Lipschitz continuity parameter. So, this can be actually any distance norm, but let me just use 2 here. So, your fx minus fx prime is less than or equal to this. So, this is a stronger condition than just your continuity, right? So if you know that your function is Lipschitz continuous, then also you can use a step constant step size. I don't remember the exact constant. Or you can use a step size which degrades like 1 by root t. And for both of them, you can give a reasonable rate of convergence. Okay. So essentially the point is that your step size can be determined if you know something more about your function if you can analyze your function better okay another way to determine step size is is through these rules called armio rules okay so basically what you'll do is you'll try to try out some different step size and whichever step size gives you the minimum objective function value you'll just take that so that is called armio rule okay so it goes something like this that suppose you start with some eta is equal to 1 and you see whether your f of x t plus 1 is less than or equal to f x t or not. If not, then you will decrease your eta by let's say a fraction that is you take eta to be half and they can again try f x t plus 1. Is it less than f x t and so on. Keep on doing this. So there are several variants of this armio rule. So again, not very precise. I am not being very precise here, but that is sort of the basic idea that you try out several step sizes and whichever gives you the most decrease in objective function value take it okay. and you can prove rate of convergence for that type of rule as well okay. so so this gradient descent algorithm is only using the gradient of your function but you can have more information about your function right so you can use gradient of your gradient that is you can use second order information about your function which will give you something called newton raphson method or newton step so that is given by xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus hessian inverse times the gradient at xt okay so here one important thing to note is that the step size doesn't come in picture at all. You don't need to determine the step size. Your Hessian inverse will in some sense determine the best step size. Okay. And what is Hessian? Hessian is essentially, so if you have multivariate um, function, then ijth element of Hessian is given by del square fxt times del of x i okay. evaluated it x t okay so this is an extremely powerful method that can lead to very fast convergence but the issue is that each step can be very expensive because first you have to compute your hessian and then you have to invert it and the inversion is a very expensive operation for matrices so if you are working in d dimensions then in general you'll need to compute uh, you'll need to do order d cube computation to be able to compute this hessian inverse which is very expensive so there are many algorithms which are somewhere in between these two algorithms and th those are called um, conjugate gradient type of methods and their idea is to use this type of iteration but 
where you also put Hessian inverse, but an approximation of Hessian inverse. You don't want to compute exact Hessian and its inverse, but you do an approximation there. Okay. So we won't go into them this class at least. Maybe in next class we'll touch touch on them. Okay. So these are these two popular algorithms for unconstrained optimization. Okay. And now let's move on to constraint optimization. Okay. And the main idea behind both the algorithms is that you want to minimize your gradient. Essentially, you want to set you want to take steps so that your gradient of fx goes to zero. Okay. But the same thing will not work for constraint optimization problem because at your optima the gradient need not be equal to zero. So there are many additional challenges for constraint optimization problems. So let's say this is your general form of constraint optimization. So for these type of problems, um, there is a very popular uh, set of conditions that will give you optimality. And those are called Karush Tucker conditions or KKT conditions in short. So before even going there, I'll need to define dual of an optimization problem. Okay. So I think I can actually turn on anyways, let's see. So before even going there, I'll need to define uh, dual of, so this optimization problem as it is like the way it is given, it is called primal optimization problem. And you can define an equivalent optimization problem called its dual, okay. So the way a dual is computed is essentially, actually I should use HJ here. So a dual optimization problem is, will be characterized by parameters lambda and nu, okay, which is given by min over x belongs to the domain of your function of fx plus summation lambda i fix hjx okay so you take your function and you add this term and this term, which are essentially sort of penalty terms for your function fix and hjx, or violating them basically. And you take minimum and that gives you g of lambda nu. And now your dual optimization problem will be maximize g lambda nu such that lambdas are all positive, lambda is greater than or equal to 0 for all i. Okay. So I'll just explain how this comes about and why are we all doing it, but let me just write down first dual formulation of a primal problem. Okay. And basically this will continue in next class also because this is a very important topic and it requires a lot of Okay. But let's just consider, you know, as a recipe, let's just consider how do you form a dual problem. So what you do is you write down the Lagrangian of your, so this is called Lagrangian function that is L of x lambda nu. So given a optimization problem of this type, you write its Lagrangian like this. Okay. And then you minimize this Lagrangian with respect to x. Okay, you take its infimum. So I should not write it. Okay. No, now the optimization is over the entire space. Okay. And that will give you a another function, which is now since you are optimization over optimizing over x, so you are just left with lambda and nu, right? So this g is only a function of lambda and nu. You have sort of optimized over x here. 
you have removed x okay and now your dual formulation will be that minimize g of lambda nu where lambda is are all positive okay so for each constraint here you have associated one lambda i and if your constraint is such that f i x is less than or equal to 0 then you require lambda i to be positive and if your h j x <coughs> equal to 0 is your constraint then your nu j can be anything it can be positive negative anything okay so these are called lagrange multipliers so you, with respect to each of your constraint you will associate a lagrange multiplier and form your lagrangian minimize your lagrangian with respect to x and that will give you your dual formulation okay so this is sort of the recipe we'll try to understand what exactly the properties of this g is and why is it useful why do we even want to consider going to this dual formulation So one interesting property to note is that so actually there are two very interesting properties of G that we write let me write so one is that G is always concave okay G is always a concave function no matter what f f i and h j are whether they are convex or not g will always be concave okay number 2 g is a lower bound on fx okay no matter what f f is it's convex or not g will always lower bound fx okay so these are two very important properties of g and there is a third property which makes it very very useful for convex optimization problems and that is that if f f i h j all of them are convex and have some other small like you know constraints some other properties which are not very restrictive then maximizer of g or maximizer of dual problem will be optimum or max or max of dual problem is equal to min of primal problem okay so i'll just draw it out so that it becomes clear can i just shift this stuff so that um Yeah, I'll just try to make this picture clear, and then we'll come in next class again and try to understand why this is happening and how are we getting it, and then uh, what are KKT conditions and how can we use them for optimization. Um, it's shutting down. One minute. so let's talk about unconstrained problem first so you can define your dual even for unconstrained optimization problems right and no matter no. what okay so let's say this is your function fx well you cannot define that let it be so this is your function fx and actually i should not have drawn this nicely let me draw it like this okay and it might be you might have some other constraints on fx 
or on x sorry and then your g of let us say lambda nu will always look like a convex concave function ok and it will always lower bound f x, but there might be some gap ok and this gap is called duality gap. So, here actually I have drawn it very nicely, but sometimes what can happen is that this optima of this need not correspond to optima of this. That is you can have a situation like this, where optima of dual problem might correspond to a very bad solution to your primal problem. Okay. But if your function f x is convex and it is subject to convex functions or convex constraints and some other small conditions hold, then the problem becomes very nice that is then the situation is very nice that is if this is your dual g x and this is your f x your optima of g x will coincide with the optima of f x that is maximum value of g x will be equal to minimum value of f x ok. And in that case your duality gap is 0 <coughs> ok. So, there might be a one to one correspondence, there might not be a one to one correspondence at the, mm, at the minima and maximum. Because suppose your function can be something like this, ok. So, you do not have a unique solution, right, and your dual can be something like this as well, ok. So, there need not be a one to one correspondence, yeah, you should be able to. you. Yeah, you should be able to compute them. So, in most of the problems, the way you compute them is um, through. Uh, so, in KKT condition, there is a condition called uh, complementary condition, and that sort of relates your primal optimum with dual optimum. And so, we'll see. I mean, in, in the case of support vector machine, we'll see how you can, given a prime a dual solution, you can compute a primal solution. But it need not be very easy every time. Okay. I mean, there's uh, there's no uh, there's necessarily no closed form solution for that, or a very closed form for, for that. Okay, it will depend on problem to problem. But what is guaranteed is that if you have optimized your dual, then at that point, and if your functions are convex and satisfy some nice property, then from that point you should be able to construct a primal optimal solution ok. So, is this clear that why why people want to study dual and uh, like you know understand this Lagrangians and go to dual formulations and why all that hard tasks because your dual sometimes because your do solving your dual is can be sort of equivalent to solving primal under good conditions and sometimes solving your dual can be easier because if you look at this dual problem in some sense it is a easier formulation because your con constraint set is fairly easy it is just non negative points ok. So, you want to optimize for lambda and nu where lambda is non negative. So, that is in some sense a easier to think of set. So, sometimes it can be much more useful to solve the dual, sometimes I mean there is no use I mean sometimes you just want to be in primal ok. So, when we will study support vector machine we will see why dual formulation can be sometimes very useful and why we might want to study it ok. So, when we will come in next class we will continue from this. 
Um, any questions? Doubts? Okay. See you next class.